Hey everyone, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Paweł Szczerbuk. I'm here today to talk about uh, efficient pipelining of persistent kernels. And I know you've heard uh, about pipelining a lot today, and I'm uh, making you uh, uh, hear, uh, hear about it uh, once more. But I'm hoping that it will, you know, like lay so, some foundations uh, if you're uh, like confused. Uh, why it's so important, this is the, the talk for you. I will um, talk about this first, then I will cover con uh, persistent kernels to finally see how to uh, bring those two concepts together and why would you want to do it. I promise to show some nice performance charts at the end of it, so please stick around if you like uh, squeezing out flops. And a huge asterisk, we are time constrained, so I will be simplifying at times, Mm, that means all the time. There is much more interesting stuff to talk about, so don't hesitate to hit me up after the talk. We have a lot to unpack, so for anyone uh, watching this on YouTube on 1.5x speed, I suggest slowing down back to one. <laughs> all right, so software pipelining. I know many people have misconceptions about it, and uh, certainly I had when I first started working in this area, so let me take a moment to set this straight. Software pipelining is not about loop unrolling. What is it then? So let's look at this laughably simplified uh, version of your favorite software primitive, Matmul loop. You go over your k dimension, loading tiles uh, of input matrices from the global memory, and calculating the dot product to finally store the accumulated result back. Obviously, you can multiply something uh, that you haven't loaded from the memory yet. So in the most naive form, you loop show this, this kind of dependency. First, you load your tensors. Then you calculate your dot product, rinse and repeat. This is far from being efficient. Both memory bandwidth and compute are idle some of the time. It would be great if we could do something like this instead. Overlap the dot product with the memory load. We got rid of some of the bubbles and our graph got shorter. Thus, proved by PowerPoint, this is more efficient. In this picture, the vertical lines represent different loop iterations. When you look at, the, uh, look at it like this, you can see that what we need to do is to execute operations logically belonging to different iterations in the same loop iteration. For example, the dot product from the blue iteration iterates in parallel with the load from yellow iteration. OK, so let's think about this more abstractly. Your loop code is usually composed of sequence of operations that depend on each other, like the dot product depends on the load. You then execute this sequence of operations multiple times depending on your loop count. Each subsequent operation in the iteration needs to wait for the one before it. As long as you don't have dependencies between the loop iterations, well, you can have some, but let's not overcomplicate it for now, and your hardware allows for some degree of asynchronicity, you can do something like this. Shift your operations between the iterations of the loop. So you're no longer waiting for the operation that is directly preceding you, rather for the one that was issued an iteration before. More formally, Different colors here there correspond to different stages. Operations from stage 1 will execute one iteration before stage n plus 1. You might have noticed that after skewing our loop like th that, there are those two pieces at the beginning and, and at the end uh, where not all of the code is being executed. We call them prologue and epilogue, and they're the cause of most of the headaches we will be talking about today. During prologue, you fill your pipeline populating subsequent stages with data. During epilogue, you drain it, using the data produced in the steady state of the main loop. One thing to notice here is that the prologue and epilogue will be longer the more stages you are using. This means that ideally, you want the number of iterations significantly higher than the number of stages. There are multiple ways to, uh, of handling the prologue and the epilogue. You can peel them out of the loop. This means that your loop is getting shorter by a number of, dependent on the number of stages. Here, we started with five iterations, and after the peeling, we only have three sandwiched between prologue and epilogue. You can keep one of the epilogue or the prologue in the loop body and just predicate the operations in some way, so they won't be executed when the pipeline is not full. This has the advantage of not changing the number of loop iterations. Finally, you can predicate both of them, but then you would need to actually increase your number of operations, of iterations. There is one more very important and interesting thing. 
you can have more stages than operations that you want to distribute between them. In this example, we have three stages and only two of them are populated with operations, with stage one being effectively empty. With this, you can make your dependencies longer, helping to hide latency of very long operations. Your operations in stage two wait for something that happened two iterations back instead of just one. This is actually what we usually do in Triton. I have glossed over many important details here. You might have noticed that uh, pipelining your loop uh, requires additional memory to hold data that won't be used until some number of iterations in the future. This is true, and it requires us to transform the code to support multi-buffering of data. The hardware also has to support asynchronous operations, and we need a lowering from things like regular loads to async loads. Uh, all this might seem a bit intimidating, but do not fret. A lot of heavy lifting is done by amazing pipeline expander in the MLIR upstream. Expander is a piece of code that given loop and a schedule describing order of operations and stage assignments, expands your loop into final pipeline. It uh, handles all the tedious parts like peeling and masking, updating dependencies between the ops, etc. Your job is to lower the ops into async versions and come up with a valid schedule for the expander. Okay, so this covers the basics of software pipelining. With this knowledge, we can move to the topic of persistent kernels and see how we can leverage uh, pipelining in this domain. All right, so what are persistent kernels? You have your output matrix that you're going to calculate and your hardware with certain amount of execution units, streaming multiprocessors, what have you. Traditionally, you would dispatch a kernel that calculates one of the uh, output matrix tiles. Scheduler in the hardware will assign it to one of the uh, available hardware execution units. Your output, uh, you would dispatch as many instances of the kernel as needed to cover your entire grid, that is your output matrix. And scheduler will keep assigning those to hardware units that are available to do the job until all of it is complete. That's great. Unfortunately, there is a constant overhead incurred in, on every dispatch. This creates a bubble between the end of the dispatch and the beginning of another, reducing the efficiency of the process. We can try something different though. What if instead of uh, having one kernel per tile and letting the hardware uh, scheduler worry about how to feed uh, units with this work, we can have a kernel that run longer and handle multiple pieces of the matrix. You're this, you, you would dispatch only as many of them as there are hardware units. Each kernel would grab the next piece of the output matrix when it's done with the previous, and you would end up reducing the constant overhead because you are dispatching only once per hardware compute unit. Again, proof by PowerPoint, this is better. So, how to do it in the code? Simplifying a ton here, start with your regular matmo loop and wrap it in another, uh, another loop, jumping from tile to tile until all of them are exhausted. You want to initialize your data pointers and accumulator at the each iteration of the outer loop. Now we can finally see uh, how important is software pipelining for the persistent kernels. Going back to the picture of our pipelined K loop, K -loop this is how it looks after the modifications. We have another layer here, new loop that goes over, uh, over our existing pipeline loop. I'm sure you uh, all see where this is going, right? So bubbles in the pipeline. There are those uh, empty spaces begging for being filled. It's also clear now that the shorter the inner loop is, the more severe the problem. It means that we will suffer the most for small k dimensions. So what can we do about this? One idea would be to prefetch loads from uh, next iteration, interleaving, interleaving them with current MMA operations. Correctly scheduling this is tricky, however, and actually at the time that we were working on this, MLIR expander did not support peeling uh, the epilogue, so there was nothing really that we could interleave with the prologue. That situa uh, situation uh, changed like uh, uh, last week. Triton has an outer loop pipelining optimization that tries to address that by putting prolog mm, and the loop body in uh, different stages and then pipelining it, but the results were still far from perfect. Okay, so what if we could somehow fuse the nested loops into a single one? Uh, if we have only a single loop, obviously the pipeliner would just kick in and everything would be fast, right? So 
how do you even start? How do you fuse the, the nested loops? Uh, so if you start with your, uh, with your persistent kernel loop, then your new loop needs to iterate over the product of iterations of the outer and inner loop. Then in each iteration, you would calculate the equivalent of inner and outer induction variables. When the k is zero, you do whatever you would normally do at the beginning of your loop. Our inner loop then becomes simply a block of code directly in the new loop you're building with the stuff that you did afterwards uh, until another condition that will be met at the final iteration before k becomes zero again. So this is manual loop fusion. That's what we did. And the effect? With just single loop, the pipeliner should, in theory, be able to do its work, interleaving prolog and epilog operations with, it, uh, with each other, creating this giant zipper, right? So easy. No need for changing the expander, building the new outer loop scheduling, and de dealing with follow bugs. Just change the kernel and enjoy the free lunch. But you know what they say. We do not do it because it's easy, but we, uh, because we thought it would be easy. Obviously, we have hit massive amount of problems. Our MATML optimized code was not prepared for any fancy control flow in the main loop. There were bugs and inefficiencies in our other pipelining components, layout conversion optimizations, axis analysis, and many, many more. I have a lot of people to thank for helping with resolving this and other issues. Finally, we also needed a slightly bigger rework of the schedule builder to allow for control uh, over placement of the if blocks in the loop to help instruction scheduler. If you're interested in any of it, let me know after the talk. I'll be happy to share more. And the last ingredient was TMA. TMA, uh, you heard about it uh, today. It's NVIDIA uh, featured uh, introduced in Hopper that allows for hardware out of bound checks. That was much needed as the loop became dense with control flow and arithmetic, making instruction schedulers life, life hard. It also provides a nice set of async operations, like stores from shared to global memory, which was a kicker since otherwise your store completely stalls or your beautifully crafted pipeline. So how much can we squeeze out of uh, the NVIDIA hopper when we put all of it together? In the GPU green corner, Kublas 12.4. The royal blue is our Triton MATML tutorial, vanilla MATML with L2 Swizzling. We fix M and N to 8K and sweep through different K values from 512 to 8K. And this is uh, FP8 MATML. You see, this is not terrible with Triton getting close and eventually even surpassing Kublas for larger and larger K. The left side is still something to work on. So, things are getting warmer, this is our persistent MATML implementation with doubly nested loops and outer loop pipelining optimization I mentioned before, we are seeing some gains. The low K is still lagging, however, mainly due to filling and draining the pipeline every outer loop iteration. With fused loops and optimizations described above, we see the jump, especially in the low K regime. We are still not quite as good as Kublas there, but for big K, we, are, we start to systematically outperform NVIDIA's implementation. And we still have our last trick in the sleeve, TMA, that should boost the performance both in the low K due to async store and big K due to simplification of arithmetic. And now we're cooking. So, yeah, like Phil mentioned, uh, that, that, that took us by, by surprise too. <laughs> and uh, obviously the work is not done yet. So TMA comes with a set of caveats. One of them is the scriptors being relatively expensive to create and fetch from the global memory. There are a couple of efforts recently landed and currently in progress around improving the situation coming from Elliot and Meta and Peter at OpenAI. There are also exi uh, exciting bigger refactor coming that ultimately aims at adding support for different user-specified schedules. This effort is led by Manman. In, uh, in the future, there is many avenues that we would like to explore, and some of them might be crucial to uh, achieve the best performance on new platforms. And that's it. Thank you very much.